So I look mm. for the diamond in everybody because everyone bears the image of God. And that's why we're so passionate. I am so fired up for you guys to meet my friend, the Reverend Cham Kaur Man, and she grew up in Punjab, a Punjabi Sikh and is the first Asian woman minister in the Baptist Union of Great Britain. Cham, I didn't even know that was possible, but there you go. Cham has over 25 years leadership experience in the church, charity and voluntary sectors. She mentors and supports leaders from a variety of sectors, backgrounds and communities. And she's the co-director of Next Leadership, which is awesome. You're going to want to find out more about that. And a certified stakeholder centered coach. Cham loves scripture and sharing stories. Um, and, you know, she shares them very much through her South Asian lens, particularly the stories of women who don't often get centered. It's probably one of my favorite things about her and um, for those women that are also on the margins. So, Cham, I'm so pumped that you are here. You're in the motherland and you can tell from my accent, this is what we sound like in the colonies. Okay. <laughs> well, Christian, <laughs> it's just fantastic to um, join you on this and to be part of this um, time together to share wisdom and learning um, with all you amazing, wonderful women out there. So my greetings to you from Birmingham, and that's Birmingham in the UK. <laughs> and she's not in Alabama, just in case you're wondering about that. <laughs> you know, that accent. So, you know, for those of us that, that are listening to this that don't have a point of reference, uh, help us to understand what it means that you grew up Punjabi Sikh, and I just need to drop in here that um, I dated a Punjabi Sikh for two years. So there you go. But yeah, help us all to know. Well, you probably know quite a lot more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> but just, just to give people a bit of a picture, really, um, Punjabi Sikh um, means that um, my parents travelled over from um, Punjab, which is in the north of India, and um, they were followers of the Sikh faith. So within that context, I grew up within a Punjabi environment. I call myself Punjabi Sikh still because I the inherited culture and traditions I carry with me, they're in my DNA. So, so that sort of locates me positionally um, from, from India, but although I was born in the UK. Wow, it is. it just blows my mind. I need a very quick kind of background. So how did you become a follower of Jesus then? Oh my goodness. If this was, if we had three and a half hours, this would be a boring <laughs> topic. But um, long, long story short, um, I grew up on a certain street and the name of the street was Marshall Street. So all you folks need to do is Google Marshall Street. And it was infamous um, for um, all the wrong reasons. But on that street, um, there was a church and um, a lot of the children from the street used to go to youth club. And while I was there, I heard about this person called Jesus. And I remember the Sunday school teachers talking about um, he could be your friend. And I remember as a toddler, and I don't know whether I was speaking to myself in Punjabi or English or a blend of both, but I remember thinking, I'd like to have a friend like Jesus. Um, and But then I just left it. And, you know, I have to be honest because food is really important to me. I turned up to youth club for sweets and play. And um, so we'd eat plenty of sweets. We'd, we'd play some games. You know, the situation, the social location for a lot of us was that as, as infants, we grew up. Um, really quickly. So we were children, but with adult heads and minds and responsibilities. So um, my family found out that I was going to church. Um, the community complained to my parents and said, what are you doing? What are you allowing your daughter to go to a what was considered a white church? Um, she will bring shame and dishonor on us. Those are very key themes within my context. And so I was forbidden from going. So um, 
for years, nothing happened in terms of um, going to church. And it was a desperate loss for me because I'd made um, connections with people there, certainly in Sunday school. And I was missing the sweets, let's be honest about that. But um, (laughs) another remarkable thing happened. Um, I was permitted to go to university. Now, in the Western context, probably going to education is not a big thing. But my role as a girl child was prescribed. And um, I, the prescription was you will honour your parents, you will have an arranged marriage, and then you will go and be part of an extended family and serve your in-laws and your husband and hopefully produce a boy child. So that was all prescribed, and that's quite normal. So there's nothing sort of um, uh, controlling about that narrative. It was just part of growing up. Um, however, I had a sense that um, I could read and write, and I had to teach myself to read and write because my, my family are illiterate. Made it to university, praise the Lord and hallelujah, um, and one of the first people I met on campus was a Christian. And she invited me to something called mission, and, and I didn't know what mission was. I thought it was a seminar or something. So I trot off to this, this uh, mission, um seminar and one of the questions that was asked was where on earth are you and that was a question that flipped me and it's like well where on earth am i what am i doing with my life so i had an encounter with jesus and jesus said follow me and i said yes but that's when all my problems began christine um (laughs) no doubt (laughs) you know um a new focus, sense of purpose, life, mission, but then I was living two lives. Um, I'm in a middle-class environment at university, and I come from a working-class background in Birmingham, from a culturally Sikh background. And there was a lot of challenge, um, and it was incredibly difficult. And for a long time, I was not allowed to go to cousins' homes. Um, there was a stigma attached to the uh, fact that as a female, as a female, a single female, I was following this, in their eyes, this white Jesus. Powerful. I, I, I'm captivated because um, I just yeah. see so many similarities. I, I grew up in a, a Greek very staunch Greek Orthodox home, you know, and very, and when I became a Jesus follower and uh, my family didn't speak to me for a very long time and I wasn't allowed to take meals with anyone. And again, even, you know, I was betrothed to a Greek guy uh, before the Punjabi Sikh. Um, I, I, I was betrothed um, and I was, you know, before I went to university and literally his mother said to me, if you go to university, uh, you cannot marry my son. The woman cannot be more educated than a man. Uh, we have a whole generation that just does not even understand that. Now, I'm 57. That was just par for the course being an immigrant. So when, as you're telling your story, I'm like hanging on the edge of my seat here because I'm like, I get everything you're saying um, and it is so real. I'm just, I, I, I want to ask you a million other questions, but I'm going to have to get you on another podcast for that because going in, so there, there is that um, – story because then I want to draw the line between that and how you're doing what you're doing now with the Baptist Union. I mean, that just blows my mind and uh, we will get there. But I wanted to ask a question that for coming from a background that was not immersed in the Christian subculture, the Christian language, um, nor did you grow up necessarily in a home that was white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. So, you know, um, so much even of our Christian subculture, both in England and in North America and in Australia, uh, is very white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. So people like us come in and uh, they have their own language, their own words that they don't realise is their own language uh, and and many times don't even realise what is cultural, what is biblical, what is scriptural and superimpose culture as if it was Bible and as if it was, um, you know, something that Jesus said that we have to do. So I, I'd love you to talk a little bit about that, about um, the strangeness of that to someone from another culture, another faith practice and how you even see it today in the church world. Yeah. Um, I mean, my experience um You see, when I said yes to Jesus, 
although it was it created a lot of difficulty when i read the biblical text i felt as if i had come home because there were stories there were narratives there was there were descriptions that resonated with me deeply um, so, you know, people would take journeys. You, you hear about people um, extending hospitality and welcome and intergenerational families, extended families. All those descriptors are there. So I felt very much at home when I was reading um, Old Testament, New Testament. Stories about Jesus, just loved it. And then I took a journey to church and I thought I'm going to have the same sense of homecoming but um, it was an incredibly alien environment. Um, I, I stepped into this white Western, predominantly um, white church. And um, so I kind of stuck out. I, you know, I couldn't blend into anywhere. So I, I, I stuck out a bit. But um, for me, um, it was a huge hurdle. Um, because when I entered into this, what felt like an alien environment, I, there were lots of questions um, and I had to work things out for myself. Um, so, for example, remember, I come from, you know, a culturally Sikh context. I would have gone to the temple. Um, I, the, the hospitality there would have been of a particular order. So I enter into a church and my first experience and questions are, why are people sitting on wooden benches um, I think they were called pews, but I didn't know that. I, I thought, this this environment is cold. We're in the UK. And people are wearing hats and coats and gloves indoors. Why, does, why doesn't somebody just turn the heat up? Um, but I realised <laughs> that people were a bit, being a bit efficient on the heating uh, area. And then it was like um, hymns, um, hymns with with words that, you know, I, I couldn't understand. And it felt as if it was, I was going back to my English degree of, you know, learning a bit of Chaucer or Shakespeare. There were too many yees, these and thous, which for me, I couldn't understand. So again, there was an interpretation piece going on there. And then partway through a long service, it felt, in a cold environment, my immediate thought was, where's the food? Um, you know, because within a temple, you, you can walk out, you can eat, the table is open, you eat, come back in, sit down, chill in a warm environment, even if it's on the floor, the floor is clean. And then, you know, um, there, were, there was all this stuff that was happening because I thought, I remember, you know, the questions were, well, we're in a holy place. Why don't people take their shoes off? You know, um, Moses was instructed, surely, or did I dream that up? Um, you know, the hospitality piece, the radical um, hospitality, you know, um, I remember being given um, a lukewarm cup of weak tea, neither of which, you know, I can yeah. say I enjoyed. And the driest <laughs> biscuit that had sat in a tin for years and years, I'm sure. So it was, there was all this, these contradictions that were occurring. And um, it was like, but then I had to do my homework. I had to learn, uh, do the church history stuff. I had to work out, um, you know, stuff about things called denominations. I thought it was to do with currency. I thought we're talking money here, but I didn't realize that there were things called denominations. And, um, you know, I had to learn about church traditions. And, um, and why did, I didn't know when to stand up, sit down or kneel. And I was always, and I think I've got good rhythm, by the way. I'm Indian. I can do my Bollywood dances. But I couldn't keep up with people stepping, standing up, sitting down, kneeling. And then they gave me something called a prayer, a, a book. And it was like, well, where do I go? There was no manual. There were no signposting um, in, in the liturgy. You know, I would speak when somebody from the front was speaking. So and I realized that I needed to respond and not to take the lead. Um, it, it was it was mind bending. So I meant I wanted to follow Jesus 
open-heartedly, but I had these other cultural hurdles that I had to navigate. And I had to do that because everybody else was in the majority. I was in the minority. So um, nobody was doing the incarnational piece of actually, here's this um, young woman. Um, I wonder what it feels like to step into this interesting environment. And let's just look through her lens. Nobody did that. So I had to do that for myself. Yeah, Jam, as you're talking, I'm thinking about how many different spaces in my life I have just assumed that people understand what's happening. And I know we have we have people in so many different leadership positions who I know are listening to this, you know, leading our leading our children when their friends come to our house and their friends maybe didn't grow up here or um, leading in your church, running a small group, running meetings at an office. And, and what you're presenting is such a needed perspective. And so, I'm wondering for for those of us who are running any sort of space, whether it's hospitality in our home or in the marketplace or church, what is something that we can start doing to make those spaces more welcoming and to drop our own assumptions about the people who are walking in the door? What's what's a tangible step that we can take? Talk to people who don't look like you, who don't sound like you build relationships that's what jesus did didn't he you know uh, you know we, we are talking deep incarnation um and just engage with people and and ask them in collaborate you know i'm i'm collaborative leadership is is my bag you know we've always had to collaborate so so let's ask the other and there are people in your teams, in your departments, who um, have never been asked the question, how does this environment, what does it feel like for you? Um, mm. Is what we do, um, does, it, does it sit well with you? Um, how can we change the buffet from a dried sandwich, and that's just a personal thing here, to, to wonderful <laughs> hot meals? You know, what is food yeah. for you? You know, a buffet with mm. salad is food for me. But what, 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 you know, it's, it's the basic stuff of eating and drinking and hospitality and making a place for people at the table. You know, don't let them invite them and then don't give them a space because that's happened um, frequently in yeah. my leadership. You know, um, people want me on the table for all sorts of reasons, um, which I'm sure you're aware of, um, but they don't always want... Um, invite me to to share an opinion or a reflection um because sometimes people aren't ready for that so so yeah. ask questions um and, and um hear their voices give them a voice give them a platform i love all of this and because i need backstory i want to know how you went from university you walk into i would imagine from the way you explained it a, a, a quite a traditional sort of anglican church which would be common in england to doing what you're doing today so um you know i don't know how many years ago that was 20 years 30 years how uh, give me that in five minutes i want to know like what led you to then be doing what you're doing with next leadership mm, well it obviously had nothing to do with me christine um it was all god <laughs> Um, I found myself in a, I then found myself in a Baptist church. I didn't even know what that was. I was homeless. I needed somewhere to stay. And there was a room at the manse. I ended up there. I felt, um, actually, I, I quite like the Baptists. They're, they're a bit radical, you know, that they're, they're um, a nonconformist. Um, and I thought, well, I can sit with some of that stuff. Um, so I felt at home with that. So I, I described myself as more Baptistic. Um, than Baptist. Um, but how did I find myself there? It was God. Because after I got my degree, I ended up in London um, just doing, you know, basic admin jobs. Um, at this church, stuff was fast tracking quite quickly. Um, ended up finding myself as a deacon in the church, but then had this discomfort inside and it was like, I don't know what to do. And then it was suggested, well, why don't you go and do a diploma at Bible college? So I ended up at what was then called London Bible College. 
um, arrived at this place. Um, I was there were very few people of color there so it was like i don't want to be here this is this is a place that's you know it's out in uh, suburbia it's not my context i felt like a fish out of water um so immediately it was like how can i get out of this um what happened long story short i ended up not doing a diploma ended up doing a degree in theology while at a bible college sensed a calling to ministry and um, I didn't understand what this calling piece was, but began to go through a discerning process with friends. Um, the challenge was, Christine, that when I then went and told my minister, um, she was not helpful or um, encouraging. And um, there was there's a long story there. Long story short, went into ministerial selection board. The selection board said yes, eventually. Um, I almost didn't get through because they thought um, I had somebody come to me at the selection board and said, um, you're not um, speaking up. Um, I was the only female in the group and the only person of colour. Actually, there was one other female and it, it was a room full of testosterone and you know, we were all there being um, sort of uh, examined, really, you know, testing our calling. Um, long story short, um, I then had to explain to the person that actually I come from a South Asian background. Um, the way that you are doing your interviews is not conducive to bringing out the best in each individual. Um, I clearly, I've never been the leader who fits a particular mold clearly. Um, so the nuances, the stuff was not nuanced enough. Um, and so I ended up at another Bible college, ended up doing another degree from somebody who couldn't even read and write doing three degrees. It is only God. Um, and then I had a terrible time in that Bible college because um, people had um, low expectations of me as a South Asian woman. They wanted to use me as a trophy, um, celebrate this brown woman, the first, um, and then lots of stuff happened in between. Then, because there were so few uh, South Asian men or women around. I didn't know anybody. I came down to Birmingham to be part of um, a black and Asian forum for clergy, Anglican led. And that's where I met my best friend now, Kate. She's a Baptist minister, very Baptistic. Um, and we, her mentor introduced us. And um, she had just come to Birmingham to plant a church we met each other and she says, I didn't know that you um, were um, going through ordination. She says, I know all the Baptist women around. And it was like, well, actually, um, I've been a bit undercover. So I'm here. And we started to talk and our language was very different. Um, but the vision was the same. So we both co-planted a church in Birmingham and the thread of um, the plant and it was in an urban context a multi area of multiple deprivation um, working with people um, who came from my social location so it was interesting that God took me back into that arena and back to Birmingham and um, we've always talked leadership you know because someone somewhere looked at me this ordinary Asian woman and said, actually, there's a diamond in there. So I look for the diamond in everybody because everyone bears the image of God. And that's why we're so passionate um, about just um, bringing out the best in people um, whose, whose language uh, might, be, might not be mainstream, but they're edge walkers and they have got something so powerful. Um, because like us, I come from the margins. Um, but for some reason, God has provided me with some opportunities to be centred. Um, but I live on the margins. Absolutely. So when, when you guys founded Next Leadership, what kind of is the, the vision and the mission of what you're doing there? Well, essentially, we mentor, we coach uh, men and women um, from from 
wherever, whatever their location, because we believe that it's not just the church context that we serve, but also pe wherever people are located, that's their mission field as far as we're concerned. So we just want to support them in the leadership. We go, we work with them from the inside out. So what is happening with you as a leader? And how can you amplify, how can we help to amplify your leadership? How can you be the best um, kingdom servant wherever you are? So we mentor, we coach, we offer spiritual formation. We have our own programs, one called Elevation, and that's for um, women leaders. And we're very excited about that. And that's an offering that's there. And we also have a particular program called Collaborative Leadership. And that's about working um, across the distinctive of race, collaborating together. And because we've always lived in a collaborative environment and we try to model um, and practice what we preach. But it's leadership, leadership, leadership. It's so beautiful how you are using every single piece and part of your story in your leadership of next leadership. It's that is absolutely so beautiful. It's such a redeeming thread where even some of the most difficult moments of what you've just shared with us. Um, that is fueling where God is taking you and where and how you are shaping this organization that you're leading. It's that is so encouraging to but me. Rachel, and so we all have that. We all have that. Um, and I, I really want to put it out there for people that our our life experiences, let's not diminish them. And um, there are parts yeah. that we can learn from and we can grow from. And you know, God wants to sort of redeem those 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 narratives and and where where you've been sort of in any way diminished your light has been diminished um there's something to be amplified um so we have our experiences but it's those aha moments those those justice moments those equity pieces that that just you know make us raw and we just i just want people to lean into uh, the best of those moments I want to know what has kept you in it this long and still passionate and still eager to uh, to continue to serve Jesus. I mean, first and foremost, Chris, and this is an obvious thing. It's all about Jesus for me. It's all about Jesus. You know, when I said yes to Jesus, I, I know what that meant. That meant that um, actually there's no going back for me as as someone from from a different faith i have no community to go back to there is no there's no turning back once i've made my decision i've nailed my colors to the ground really um what's mm -hmm. kept me going it's it's just recognizing that we have a god who redeems that when we go back to genesis we look at creation story you know um god created beautiful things and people and intended us to collaborate and live together and to to bring together equity and justice those themes just flow throughout scripture and i want to see that in our time i pray that we will get a glimpse of that that women will rise men will rise voices that have been on the margins can be centered and um, that that um we will collaborate across our distinctives yeah. joyfully. Um, yeah. That's what keeps me going. Um, and knowing that God is waiting for us to do something. God is waiting. And, and I, just want, I just want to make sure that I am as prepared and ready as I possibly can be to step into the spaces that he invites me into. Um, and not everybody does invite me, so let me just put it out there, you know. Um, but, um, but I'm ready. I'm ready wherever God wants to lead me. It, you know, my life is his. My life is his. And there's nowhere else I could go. I can't do anything else, actually, Christine. You know, this is it. Um, you know, whatever I have, whatever offering I have, it goes before God. I'm blown away. So I'm pausing. I, just, I thought Rachel was about to jump in. So I just was, I was oh. waiting. Oh, sorry. I saw the time. So I just assumed yeah. you were going to, you were wrapping. Sorry. No, we're good. You want to go? And then I'll, and then I'll wrap. Yeah. Cham, the vision, the vision that you have of seeing, um, seeing people on the margins rise, that 
I hear that, and that that is so biblical to me. Like your the way that you speak about justice is so encouraging and it, it lights a fire in me. And so I just for for our people who are listening who so deeply value justice, but feel so overwhelmed at how many different things there are to care about and how many different scriptures there are. What encouragement would you offer to them? I, I, I invite them to, to, to go through the scriptures. You know, um, for me, a very special uh, verse has been um, Psalm 139. It's remembering who we are, who God has called us to be. And that there is anointing and purpose. And each one of us has a unique and what I call a peculiar DNA. And there are things that only you can do. Nobody else can step into those spaces. Nobody has that influence, that authority, um, that anointing to speak into those situations. So I would just encourage everyone, ask God. Lord, you know, if I am just broadened, I'm looking at too many distractions, narrow it down, give me laser vision, laser focus. What has my name on it? And then just go for it. I love that. I'm going to dive in, Cam. Cam, we could talk to you like all day, but I want to echo that, you know, um, dive in and go for it. And God will show you. I was 40 when we started 821 and I wasn't even looking for it. And God brought it across my path and you know today it's it's exploded because it's in the heart of God I think once you'll find God will lead you and once you take that first step uh you'll find that God cares God cares deeply um for those on the margins and uh you know and wants us to be involved um in doing that work I it, you know some so many of the discussions that are happening around the world today I just kind of think wow I don't know why anyone wants to hijack anything from the outset you read from Genesis to Revelation, justice is what is on God's heart. And so anyway, um, you have inspired us. I could sit at your feet forever. I'm loving this. I, you are just Seriously. pouring out such great wisdom. And um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Cham, for hanging in there. Um, thank you that you haven't given up and thank you that you continue to encourage us. And so I want all of our listeners to know that Cham's details are listed and tagged in the description of this episode. So I want you to keep up with her, check out Next Level Leadership and so many amazing things that they do. And so for all of our listeners, you all know how much uh, we love you, we appreciate you, and just thank you so much for joining us here on the Propel Women podcast. And we'll see you back here next week. Thank you so much for joining us today. Make sure to subscribe to this channel to get notified every time a new video is posted. We are so glad that you're here and look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you.